following interview was conducted with our interdisciplinary engineering alumnus, Brian Harris, uh, for the Purdue University Archives and Special Collections Oral History Program. Brian graduated from Purdue in 1975 and is one of the founders of the National Society of Black Engineers, also known as NSBE. His current role is serving as a construction management consultant. Uh, the interview took place on July 7th, 2018 in Oak Park, Illinois at the Oak Park Public Library. And the interviewer is Tasha Zephyr. So welcome, Brian. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Tasha. I'm glad it's to have you it's here. a pleasure to be here. And to begin, could you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Well, um, I am married. I live in Chicago, Illinois. I live on the south south side of Chicago. Um, have been a resident of the south side of Chicago for about fifteen years now. Previously, I lived in Evanston, Illinois, and lived in Evanston for about twenty years. But um, the decision to move to the South Side, uh, one, wanted um, to get back into the city. Evanston's a, a suburb, but wanted to have more of a, a city experience, not that you don't get that in Evanston. I was in the city every day, so it's not a situation where I felt isolated or removed living in Evanston, but I just, I, I wanted more of a, I guess, a neighborhood or a community feel that I, I just was missing living in Evanston. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was, my wife and I, we were both, um, you know, both, you know, driven to try to find a location in, in the city. And I think, too, part of, you know, part of the, um, the journey or the search to live in the city was the fact that so much of our family was in the city. So we did feel a little isolated. We, um, we had older family members that, you know, we would come and visit on a regular basis, but it's always nicer to be 15, 20 minutes away versus an hour away. Mm -hmm. So that prompted us to say, hey, you know what, so-and-so's getting on in years, and we want to, you know, we just want to be in a position where we can get to them sooner and we, both of us, um, were both really family oriented. So mm -hmm. it was a situation where, as opposed to seeing family members occasionally, we would see family members routinely. So there was my wife's grandmother that we would go and spend time with at least once a week. And uh, my mother, she lives in the city. My father lives in the suburbs. There's aunts dispersed, aunts and uncles that are dispersed in the city. So it was just a case of just being in a position where we could be closer to family, you know, nieces and nephews. Now, my daughter, um, she lives, she currently lives in Atlanta, but at the time she lived in Houston because I had at one point uh, lived in Houston. I lived in Austin. So did did some moving around uh, after after leaving Purdue, but um, you know, like I say, just getting back into the city was something that we we were really interested in, and then we wanted to uh, take on a project. Being that my background is construction, we wanted to take on a project that the two of I two of us could you know collectively deal with, and so we decided. Her family owned a property in the South Shore community, which is right on the lake. And as you and I had talked about earlier, I'm, I'm drawn to water. So when we, we were, it took us about a year to determine that we were going to work on this project because we had gone and looked at properties all over the, the greater metro Chicago area. And we had actually in an area that has recently undergone a lot of development, um, the, the West Loop area, we had actually purchased a property in that area. But shortly after purchasing the property, we talked with the developer and we wanted to make some, some changes. And with me having a construction background, I knew that these changes didn't require a lot of effort on the developer's part. But the developer was sending us through a lot of changes, and so we decided, you know what, 
this, this isn't a good deal for us. So fortunately, our realtor, who had been a very good friend who we had previously purchased properties from, she said, hey, you know, I'll get you guys out of this deal. So we sold, we were able to sell that property, and we continued our search, and we finally decided on a property that my, my wife's family actually owned. And it was a rental property. So we decided that we would redevelop that property and convert it to condominiums. And we would live in one of the condominiums. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And so that got us back into the city. So that was 2003. Okay. Prior to that, though, we lived in Evanston. So when we moved back into the city, after we, it took us about two years to redevelop the property, the, the building itself. It's a small six-unit building. Um, so there's six condos, and we occupy one of them. And it took uh, about two years to do it. But in the course of time that we did that, we made sure that we completed and sold the other properties before we actually moved in ours. So we were the last owners to move into our development. So we moved into that property, and at that time, that area, that south, the South Shore area, um, it's an area that's you know, gone through some hard times, let's say that, you know, it, I can remember when I was an undergrad, I would say probably just out of high school, um, starting Purdue and visiting that area. You know, I was, again, drawn to the water, so over at the lake a lot, and visiting that area, and as it turns out, that's where I had my first apartment when I graduated from Purdue. I moved in and right down the street from where I live, currently live now. So it's really a coincidence mm -hmm. that, that I moved so close to where I originally had my first apartment. So moved, moved to that area. Um, but once, you know, I would say probably at the time that we redeveloped our condo, which was early 2000, I'd say probably 10 years previous, the area started going through a change where you were losing population, you, um, the business district was starting to die. So whenever that happens, you know, it's going to affect the community. So you, you're losing stores, you know, you're losing merchants, you're losing banks, those kind of things were occurring. So... Not only did we move into the area and, you know, redevelop our building, but we, we kind of took it on as a challenge. We said, okay, we're going to come into the area and we're going to see how we can spur development, not only where we live, you know, but in the community itself. And so there were people that live in our, in our building that had like-minded interests. So it's something that we're still... It, it is still a, a journey. It's a journey that hasn't been completed because it's something that we're still dealing with. But it, you know, it's ongoing, but it's, um, it's something that has driven us, and it still drives us today. So, uh, again, we've, we've lived in, in the city for 15 years. Um, I started a uh, construction management consulting firm about 20 years ago, but... Uh, Construction's always been my passion. So even prior to high school, I was always involved in just doing projects of a construction nature. So I was always drawn to that. So uh, the fact that I'm doing it now is not a surprise. Um, but what's different now versus, say, 20 years ago when I started uh, my firm is that I'm nearing that retirement age or what should be the retirement age. So what my wife, my wife is trying to get me to kind of moderate my schedule. So as opposed to working six days a week, you work five days a week or four days a week. And as opposed to working 10, 12 hour days, you work eight, maybe even six hour days. So again, it's, it's kind of, kind of gradually entering into that retirement or semi-retirement you know, mode. So that's that's where I am right now. And it's good because as you get older, or what I found as I've gotten older, 
certainly people that are as old or older than me need attention. And so it's given me being able to, one, being self-employed and moderate my schedule, it allows me to uh, have the flexibility to deal with situations that I wouldn't be able to deal with if I, if I was in a rigid work routine. So I find that to be really rewarding. And as I say, one of the drivers to move back into the city was being able to, you know, visit and uh, keep in close contact with older family members. You know, and as they, you know, as they get older, you know, they have health issues. And so, you know, just the fact that maybe something as simple as going to the store for them or taking them to a doctor's appointment or something is, you know, we, we kind of take for granted, you know, but to them, that's, that's major. That's a, a major effort. And as I say, you know, both my wife and I, and, you know, we're, we're both similar in that respect that, you know, we really are drawn to being part of, you know, the network or the support system for our families. So as a result, it's like, you know, at some point in time every week where there's somebody that we're in contact with, we're trying to visit, we're trying to check on, we're doing something for. And, um, you know, it, it takes up a lot of time, but it, it's rewarding. It's very rewarding. So, did, did you grow up in an environment similar to that with a lot of giving back in the family? Yeah. Um, the way our, our, I've always, my family, the family structure, my, my father's side of the family as well as my mother's side of the family, we, we were always close. Uh, we had my mother's mother, she, for a period of time, she lived with us. She, she was that, that parent. Nowadays, what you'll find is seniors will either move into a, a senior living facility or if they have major health issues, they're in a, a nursing or a rehab facility. Well, 50 years ago, even sites to go back 60 years ago, when my grandmother was living with us routinely, she would, as opposed to, you know, at that point, Families would more often than not encourage a senior, and my grandmother was widowed, so they would encourage a senior to move in with a family member as opposed to putting them into a facility. So my grandmother, for whatever reason, she kind of liked living with us a lot. So she would do maybe two-year stints with us. So she would live in our home for a couple of years at a time. And so that... Living, having that kind of living arrangement, the the building or the living environment that we were in, my father's mother, we lived in a, a two-story building, so my father's mother lived on the second floor, and we lived on the first floor. So you had my paternal grandmother living on the second floor that I could see anytime I wanted to, and then my maternal grandmother living with us, living in our house. So... I think that's what kind of created um, the attitude or the, the nurturing in me to say, hey, you know, let's stay close to, to family. And then we would have my maternal grandmother's birthday was Christmas Eve. So every Christmas Eve, family members would gather at our house because she was, you know, like I say, more often than not, she was living with us. And so we would gather at our house and we would have a big party and, you know, as people, as families celebrate Christmas and Christmas Eve, they typically do. That was a big celebration because it was her birthday. So um, I think, you know, like I said, just growing up uh, early on, um, those habits or patterns were developed in terms of just dealing with family, being close to family. Yeah. And which neighborhood did you grow up in? Um the area that I grew up in was called the Garfield Park community, okay, and that's on the south side of Chicago, near south side, but um, that area, um, 5500 south, 
not too far from I-94, the Dan Ryan Expressway. Okay, so that was the community that I grew up in. Um, again, always having a passion for, let's say, arts and crafts, for lack of a, a better description, because uh, I, for a period of time, I didn't know if I was going to be an architect or an artist even, because I spent some time at the Art Institute. Uh, I did a couple of summers intensives at the Art Institute, um, you know, when I was in elementary school, you know, and got that kind of exposure. And I've always, I've always appreciated art and architecture. So in high school, I, before, you know, deciding on engineering, I kind of thought I might be an architect. But once I got to Purdue, and Purdue really didn't offer a program in architecture, it was like, okay, we're going to go down the path of engineering, and we're going to get into a curriculum that's as close to architecture as possible. So civil engineering, construction management. And so that's how, you know, um, I ended up in interdisciplinary. And interdisciplinary was a new curriculum that was created when I was a, a sophomore. Uh, where you could pretty much tailor your own curriculum. And so I combine engineering with construction and, and management courses to kind of create, you know, tailor make my curriculum. Okay. So, you know, it, it worked out. It worked out very well for me. So, how mm -hmm. did you end up um, become interested in applying to Purdue and going to Purdue specifically? Because you weren't interested in engineering at Purdue from the beginning, were you? Well, no, I mean, I. When you say Purdue, I, I, I really wasn't, I was aware of schools in state, like the University of Illinois, Northwestern University, University of Chicago, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. Those are the kind of schools that were known to me that I would talk to people that, okay, so-and-so attends this, this school, mm -hmm. but as far as Purdue, but um, one of one of our technical advisors when we were uh, in high school exposed us to pre-engineering activities and he had mentioned Purdue and then once that seed was planted and you hear references to the Chicago Six when we all started talking uh, I think it was generally understood that we were all going to try to go to Purdue and so that's how I ended up at Purdue. I mean, I applied to uh, University of Michigan, University of Illinois. Um, I'm trying to think. I know for a fact those two, and they both Big Ten uh, schools, and I was accepted to both of them, but uh, I gravitated to Purdue because that's where, uh, you know, my support staff was. You know, it's like, like I said, you know, my friends – you know, like, hey, everybody's going to Purdue. This is where I'm going to go. So, <laughs> that's so right. Yeah. <laughs> how did that group of friends form? Who was in the group? <laughs> well, again, when you when you hear references to the Chicago Six, um, you know, George Smith, Ed Coleman, Tony Harris, Stan Curtley, John Logan. You know, as you know, both John and uh, Stanley are deceased, but we all went to high school together, with the exception of Ed. And um, that was Lim Bloom. we went to Limbloom, Limbloom Technical High School on the south side of Chicago. And, um, you know, that's where that, that relationship formed uh, freshman year. George and I actually, we lived in the same neighborhood, the same community, because I met George the first day of freshman year on the bus. So we rode the bus to school. Um, that initial bus ride going to school, we met, um, and I, I don't, I can't say, I don't remember exactly how, you know, the meeting took place or conversation, you know, who started the conversation, but the fact that we were riding there together, uh, we got off at the same stop, we realized that we were going to the same place, so... <laughs> Because he actually got on the bus before I did. But once we determined that, okay, hey, we're going to the same location, um, you know, like I say, conversation developed. And uh, 
it was a coincidence that we were in the same homeroom. So you, you're talking about a situation where, well, I was on the bus with you earlier, and then when we get here, and again, you're walking around as a freshman, so, you know, you feel, you, you know, you feel kind of out of place because you don't really know what's going on. And uh, then we get to homeroom, and it's like, oh, wow, we rode the bus together. So, again, <laughs> exactly. So I was like, there's one person I know. Mm-hmm. So um, then we... Again, you, you're riding the bus back and forth every day and realizing that we don't live too far apart, and that friendship developed. Mm-hmm. And uh, because of some of the s- similar classes that we took, Tony Harris, Stan Curtley, John Logan, uh, we were all, we didn't have the exact same classes, but you might have a couple of classes with somebody. So again these these relationships or friendships formed and in our freshman year that group was probably firmly established in terms of what is known as the Chicago Six and then as we progressed in school you know we became you know even you know better and better friends and by the time we were seniors you know it was a situation where it's like okay we're we're gonna all go to the same school and so as a result, Purdue was a choice. Okay. Mm-hmm. Were there any other influences? So besides peers, the high school pre-engineering curriculum that ended you up on that path to Purdue? I would say probably for me the strongest was, like I say, just the fact that, you know, my group of friends, my close friends, all wanted to go there. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't it wasn't a situation where I individually said, you know, one, that I was that aware of Purdue, and two that, okay, I'm definitely going to be an engineer. But as I say, with the exposure, was with the limited exposure that I had to engineering and the fact that, hey, all my buddies are going to go to Purdue, then that was the choice for me. And so that, that was the real driving force because, uh, as I say, I had gotten accepted to University of Illinois. It was, it was really, it was kind of an anxious time for me because I had gotten accepted to the University of Illinois and they had actually given me a scholarship. So it was a situation where it's like, okay, everything is set for me to go there financially, mm-hmm. but I wanted to go to Purdue. And Purdue, being an out-of-state out of school, they weren't offering a full scholarship. And I knew I needed to get a scholarship in order for my parents to afford you know, me to go there. Right. So I did a lot of proactive lobbying with the registrar, with the bursar, um, also with, um, you know, the minority engineering office to see how I could get some monies to go. And I would say probably a month before school was supposed to start, everything came together. So it was to be. Yeah, I mean, because like I said, and, and when you say a month, when you talk about if school is starting in August, end of August, early September, and it's, you know, it's not until, let's say, the 1st of August that you know definitely where you're going, that was, that was an anxious time, you know, because, again, you're having conversation with everybody, and everybody, yeah, we're going to Purdue, we're going to do this, we're going to, and you're sitting there like, I don't know for sure what I'm going to be doing, you know, and, and, and a lot of times you're not sharing that information because you're kind of like you're assuming that everything is going to fall into place and you know how you know things can happen (laughs) but as it turns out it worked out for me so uh, I was fortunate in that respect but no um, again going to Purdue was you know I think it it was it was fate in that like I say Uh, my support my support group all wanted to go, uh, and I wanted to be part of that group. And uh, and then, like I said, I think my own individual efforts in terms of trying to get the financial assistance that I need to go, uh, you know, that that was the driving force in terms of being able to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think had I not had that group of friends going there, I probably would not have made the effort that I did 
to get financial assistance. I would have liked, oh, well, you know, I'll go to University of Illinois. They're going to give me a scholarship. It's no big deal, you know, because at 17 years old, uh, I, I think I look back on it. The average 17-year-old is not uh, communicating, writing letters. I mean, that was before the Internet. So, I mean, it was a situation where, you know, you actually wrote a letter or made a phone call to find out, hey, you know, what do I need to do in order to get this, you know, to do this. And so um, when I think about the efforts that I made to get into Purdue, uh, as I say, it was to be, uh, but at the same time, uh, it was the kind of initiative that most teenagers don't take. Mm -hmm. So it, it, as I say, I just, I feel like it was, it was to be, it worked out for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you got into the first year of engineering? Or? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what was that um, experience like? What Ooh. was the environment like during your first Ooh. year at Purdue? That was daunting. That was an eye-opener because, again, being, uh, we went to a technical high school, Robert, Robert Limboom Technical High School, so it was college prep before the term college prep was really used. And the, the classes that we were taking uh, certainly you felt like you were prepared to go into uh, an environment like Purdue. But, you know, it was like I say, I had no idea how challenging it was going to be because, you know, you're taking, uh, in high school, you're taking uh, college algebra, tr you know, trigonometry, college algebra, uh, physics, you know, all of the core requirements that you would need in engineering curriculum, particularly in the freshman year, that you feel like, okay, this is preparing me. And then when I got there and some of the students that I was exposed to, like in the case of college algebra, the book that we were using, they were like, oh, we use this in our senior year. So whereas I'm sitting there like totally lost mm -hmm. in terms of what's going on, they're, they've got their arms folded like, oh, this is a piece of cake because we've already, you know, you know, we've already done this. We've, we've already gone through this. And I kind of prided myself when I was in high school, you know, not only I, but I think a lot of our group, we prided ourselves in. Well, even though you had study hall and most people would, you know, cram for exams and, you know, go through that whole study routine. Mm -hmm. We pride ourselves in not taking books home. So we were like, you know, we're smart. We don't, we don't need to study. We don't need to do this. So then you get to Purdue, and it's, you're looking around, and you're like, I don't have a clue. I'm, I'm lost. I mean, I mean you, you realize then how difficult that next level is. And so uh, it, it caused, for me personally, I can only speak for myself, mm -hmm. it, it caused me to be a lot more disciplined, you know, and, to, and, and, in the, and that didn't happen in the first year. It took a couple of years for me really to, to make that revelation because in the first year I was, I was dealing with the freedoms of being at college, away from home, not having the supervision of my parents. So, you know, you're being social. And social is not just going to parties, but social is... Well, there's some kind of social activity going on uh, on campus, uh, particularly with the minority students. There's different programs that were happening that you might deal with on any given day of the week. But in terms of, say, the parties, that would start on Thursday. So you're talking Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and in some cases Sunday that you were being very social. So if you look at that period of time that you were being social, that didn't leave a lot of time for really dealing with your studies. And again, having that mindset of, I don't really need to study, the, the first semester was really one that, like I say, it was an eye-opener because mm -hmm. it made me realize, one, how I had to uh, reorganize my priorities and understand that, you know, hey, you know, if I'm going to remain here and if I'm going to excel here, that, you know, I mean, there are some changes that I have to make in terms of the way I approach things. And then 
in terms of you know, not having the supervision of my parents, being away from home. I think that I handled that pretty well because, again, the efforts that I made to actually enroll at Purdue, and particularly dealing with the financial aspect of it, um, my parents were really not that involved in that process. That was really me. It was not so much, you know, my mom and dad, you know, doing the outreach and making the phone. I was actually doing that. And I think back on it now and I'm like, you know, at 17 years old to, to do this is, you know, it's like I say, it's not the norm. It's not the norm. But I think that I had a level of maturity, not to pat myself on the back, but I think I had a level of, uh, of maturity that enabled me to be basically deal with, you know, the environment that I was in socially. So I didn't, I didn't go off the deep end. So I didn't go off the deep end in terms of, you know, dealing with that freedom. But as I say, as far as, you know, uh, my study habits and whatnot, I had to, I had to totally, totally change the way I approach things. You know, dealing with study groups, uh, dealing, you know, finding the TAs to help me deal with stuff. I mean, I had to. I had to do that because it was a struggle. And the the first two years, uh, like I say, that was an awakening. And then junior and senior year, once I realized how I needed to approach things, then I knew how to contact those resources to get the help that I needed. And that's when I started excelling because the first two years, you know, Again, things were difficult. You drop a class. So uh, I found myself every summer being in summer school. So I was going to school year-round because in the summers, you know, you start out with X amount of hours and you drop a class. Well, that puts you behind in terms of your requirements to graduate. So it's like I had to make that up in the summer. So every summer I was going to summer school, and and typically I'd go to uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. So... um, That was, you know, in terms of proximity to my home. And I just, I like the campus set up. You know, I like their campus because if I had gone to school in the city, that's probably where I would have gone to that that, uh, location. But every summer I found myself in summer school, went to summer school to make up. And so it was always, uh, you know, I, I find myself always in that I'm trying to recover or in that makeup mode. And then once I got to my junior year, uh, that's probably when I did the best the second semester of my junior year because because of the fact that I had dropped classes and I needed you know X amount of hours to graduate, I ended up, I think I took about 20 hours that second semester of my junior year, but I made the dean's list with that course load because, again, I had figured it out, so to speak, in terms of, okay, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to approach things. And also, um, I think part of it was, again, taking a, another step as far as that, that maturity scale where I moved off campus so I moved off campus, uh, moved into a house, and again, with my support group. So there was John Logan, there was Tony Harris, there was George Smith, and we moved into a house. And, um, you know, it was a situation where, okay, not only uh, do you have to um, – be disciplined in terms of be disciplined and self motivated in terms of dealing with your studies, but now you also have the responsibility of, you know, dealing with your rent because we were renting, dealing with preparing your meals. So there was no okay, you go into the you know cafeteria and the meals are being prepared. So you you're really taking all of these responsibilities on, and I think that was helpful in terms of just preparing me for life after Purdue. And so when you were doing these recovery or makeup courses at IIT in the summer, was that, you were dropping courses at Purdue, or could you explain that in a little more detail? 
every every semester I I'd say for the first the first first four semesters of you know freshman and sophomore year it was so challenging to me that you know I would sign up for classes and during the course of the semester I'd end up dropping a class you know because it was like hey you know what you you're going to take an incomplete I mean you you're not going to be able to finish this class successfully so I would end up dropping the class and have to make it up during the summer okay yeah Absolutely. and that and that was that was a trend because, like I said, every summer, at least, yeah, freshman, sophomore, and junior year, every summer I went to summer school. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what was it about the IIT campus that you felt a little more familiar with? It's not so much that I was familiar with it, but it was it was inner city. So okay. it was an inner city. It was inner city campus. Um, but they had a really they had a great engineering program there as well. Mm-hmm. You know, so I just I like that environment. Uh, again, um, for me, probably part of my decision to go there, aside from the fact that I was comfortable in that environment and it was not that far from where I lived, um, the architecture of the of the of the campus, because it was, you know, a lot of the buildings were Mies van der Rohe buildings, and so it was like just again having an interest in architecture. You know, I just like the way the campus was set up, you know, okay. the look of the buildings and whatnot. So uh, it all made sense, you know, but that's that's where I ultimately that's where I ended up going to summer school every year. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever consider like hmm, maybe I should have gone here to begin with or what, why it would have been different going there as opposed to. Virginia? No, no, I, I think it, I think, again, everything when I look back on the Purdue experience, um it was all pluses. It was all positive. Everything I, you know, I don't look back on the, on that experience and say, well, you know what, if I had to do it over again, I probably wouldn't have gone here because I, I, I never had, I never find myself saying that because again, going to Purdue, you know, being however many miles away from home, uh, being in that environment, uh, really, helped with my maturing process. Mm-hmm. It, it helped me. You know, and I don't think it would have been the same. There were ex- distractions that I would have had had I gone to school in Chicago. Just the fact that I would have been more accessible in terms of f- certain friends and family. You know, that, you know, I, I would have been distracted or I probably would not have had the same focus as I did when I went to Purdue. Because, again, you know, being in, in West Lafayette, um, you know, there's not a whole lot to do but focus on, you know, being a student. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's not, you don't, you don't have a, a nearby big city. I mean, Indianapolis is not that far away, but at that time, Indianapolis wasn't really considered the, the thriving metropolis that some people call it now. But, you know, it's just a situation where you're, you're in, you know, uh, in an environment where, you know, this is set up for you to be a student and not to go off and do a lot of other things. Now, again, like I say, there was the social environment, but you, once you learn how to navigate that and that, you know, be drawn into that all the time, then you're okay. So again, like I said, it's it, it was a perfect environment to to for academics to be a student. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so as you're figuring out how to navigate that environment, um, were there any other people or groups that helped supported you through that? Well, certainly the uh, the minority engineering program was you know Dr. Bond. I mean, he was instrumental. I mean, you know, I I can't talk about him enough because, I mean, not only was he a key advisor, I mean, you know, day one in terms of what classes to take, but, you know, um, you know, he was, you know, he was that individual that uh, he took the, the, the kind of interest that he took in the students. I mean, he he became that that parent, that surrogate parent, 
you know, because uh, he was an older, you know, older individual, you know, older than us in the sense that uh, he was closer to our parents' age than our age. So you're talking about a, uh, an individual who was that mature adult uh, personality that we could we could go to that we could lean on and he took a he, he took a major interest in us not not just academically but personally and so that was important and then the different the different other people that he exposed us to um, I mean it, it just it it was a, a situation where as I say once 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 I got once I got through the first two years and really understood what you know what what my role was or what my purpose was in being there you know then the focus became pretty clear and then people like Art Bond uh, like Sonny Taylor who was involved in the minority engineering program at that time different folks like that um, I mean they were people that that just helped keep me on the straight and narrow so can you tell me a little bit about how you first got involved with the local Black Society of Engineers? Well, again, um, so much of what I did was as part of my group and not individually. So, you know, I'm not sure who initially, you know, how I initially found out about the Society of Black Engineers, but knowing that there were meetings, attending the meetings, and there were upperclassmen like Ed Barnett, you know, that was really involved at the time when we were freshmen, because Ed was a senior when we were freshmen. And again, Dr. Bond uh, encouraging us to, hey, you know, you need to, you know, you need to be familiar with this. You need to be exposed to this. And so once I don't know how soon after getting to Purdue I got exposed, but once I got exposed, I was hooked. So it was like, okay, this is something. This is something I need to be part of. So as I got in, you know, more and more exposed to it, uh, wanted to take a leadership role. So as you know, time progressed, and you become a sophomore and a junior, then it's like, okay. The Ed Barnett's, those individuals that had been the officers and the leaders, you know, they were graduating. So it was like it was time. It was time for me to step up to take on leadership responsibilities. And so that's how I, that's how I got involved as as an officer, and got more and more involved in the organization, and ultimately um, where with you know collectively with. Um, not only the Chicago Six, but other members of the organization determined that, hey, you know, we need to take this thing nationally. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I know, like, in the Purdue records, they, they credit um, Dr. Bond, Ed Barnett, and also Fred Cooper with the formation. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything about Fred? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> the, the main thing I remember about Fred, he was on the football team, you know. <laughs> so, but... Fred, Fred, you know, he was a more reserved personality. Ed was an in-your-face individual. Ed, you, you didn't miss Ed. You knew Ed was there. Ed was that, I mean, you know, he was an extrovert. Mm -hmm. So Ed was that person. He was perfect. He was the perfect individual for, you know, uh, a startup or fledging organization. You know, he was that, that individual where um, he was you know, that type of individual that he would go and talk to some of the majority, more established uh, organizations on campus that we use to model our organization. Um, what were some of those organizations? Well, um, you had uh, the Society of Mechanical Engineers. You had uh, various uh, fraternities and sororities that were firmly established on campus, that um, they had study groups. And, I mean, you know, you had a situation where 
within a lot of those organizations, they had uh, engineering students. So it was a case of, like again, modeling or patterning, our, patterning ourselves after these organizations and realizing that, hey, they've got a formula, we don't have to re re reinvent the wheel. So it's like if we pattern ourselves after that and we follow their lead, um, you know, we'll find success. So again, like I say, uh, Ed and Fred both were instrumental in that respect. Uh, Ed was not an athlete, but as I say, he was an extrovert. Um, he was, um, he was, a, you know, he was a Greek. He was in a fraternity, so he was a very social person. Fred more laid back, more reserved on the football team, but again. That gave Fred a different perspective because being a student athlete, there were things that he was exposed to as a student athlete that the typical student would not be exposed to. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, that was an experience that he brought to the table. So, you know, those two guys, as well as other individuals, there are a lot of individuals, and I can't remember all the names, but there are a lot of individuals, upperclassmen, that were very instrumental in terms of the formation of the Society of Black Engineers. And then, as I say, as you know, as they transitioned and we became upperclassmen, uh, and we took on leadership roles, then the buzz was, okay, this this can be a national organization. And that was a realization that we that we made. And then we talked. We we had friends that went to other schools that were in engineering curriculums. And so there was, you know, there was a, a desire. We talked to different friends and there was a desire uh, talking to different people. There were some of the s same type of uh, desires that, you know, our friends had at their, at their schools where it's like, well, you know, Here's some of the problems that we're running into. Here's some things that we're dealing with. And we felt like, okay, if we collectively look at these situations and we come together, we can certainly, you know, tackle these problems easier as a larger group than a smaller group. So I think that was some of the motivation as well, is us, you know, making a determination that, all right, we, we need to take this show on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in addition to just the challenges of being an engineering student, what were some of the challenges of being a black engineering student at that time? Well, uh, again, um, the lack of exposure to certain things. Um, finances. Um, being a black engineering student, well, okay, you know, initially, I, I think when you initially come in and you're sitting in a, you're sitting in a lecture hall, and the lecture hall has hundreds of people, and you see a handful of black students in there. You know, you feel it, there's a level of intimidation that you feel because you're like, wow, you know. And I have, me personally, I grew up in a predominantly black community, in a predominantly minority community. Um, but my mindset has always, you know, it, it's always been broader than just my immediate environment because the things that I was exposed to by my parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts, um, as I say, you know, I got exposed to the Art Institute when I was, you know, a young kid. Um, the areas, I can remember many times when I was with, when I was um, in grammar school and my mom what we would typically do is I have a sister that's three years younger than me and then one that's eight years younger than me. So being the older brother, my mom would have us um, take public transportation at that time. There were, there were no Ubers. So you get, on, you get on public transportation, whether it's the bus or the elevated train, and you travel to our loop area, the downtown shopping district. So we would meet my mom. And in doing that, um, you would come in contact with different ethnic groups. So I, I was never, I was really never intimidated, you know, being around other ethnic, 
ethnicities until I got to Purdue. And then it's like, well, you're in this engineering curriculum. You're in this lecture hall. There's only a handful of minority students in here. You know, you, you feel, you feel kind of out of place. And then, you know, you're not sure in terms of your performance how you stack up against these other students. So that makes you anxious. At least it made me anxious. Mm -hmm. And then you're in class and you find out that some of these students are, they're on an accelerated pace because, you know, some of the classes that we're studying as freshmen and sophomore, they had studied in high school. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, it was, there were different things, there, there were different things that, that played on my psyche that, you know, I look back on now and I say, well, you know, I probably wasn't as prepared as I would have liked to have been. Being a minority student based on, like I say, the environment that I came out of, you know, but I had to, I had to gather myself quick because, again, part of my um, financial financial aid package was being on work study. Okay, we had a program called work study, and I don't know if that still exists, but the work study program, I worked in the mortar pool. So what I did was wash and gas the the cars, the automobiles that are used, you know, for you know, faculty to go off campus, take trips and whatnot, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and again, I don't know if that's still, I, I would have to assume that still exists because, again, I see a lot of times when I'm driving on the highway, I'll see a van or something from, you know, different different schools. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, ha I can't say that I've seen it from Purdue, but I've seen different schools where it's like, okay, you know, they these folks are on a they're on a field trip or they're taking some kind of trip because they're in a van and they've got you know they got the name of the you know name of the school on the side of the van. But anyway, I did that freshman and sophomore year, and so the exposure that I had to faculty uh, and grad students, you know, I mean, there were few, if any, that were minority. You know, so again, it's it 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 helped me in terms of socializing me how how I was able to interact and engage with these individuals. And I mean, you know, it may have been no more than here are the keys to the car, or that that's your car over there. But just you know, like I said, how I interacted and engaged with them that helped mold me in terms of you know my personality and how to deal with being a minority being, you know, being an engineering student, and then uh, some of the conversations that we would have at our meetings in terms of what some of the other organizations were doing that we wanted to do but weren't doing, and we were asking ourselves the questions of, well, why aren't we doing this? So then it was, okay, well, we're not doing this. Either we don't have the funding to do it, or we just haven't done the outreach to find out, hey, can we can we get involved with this? You know, I mean, there was nothing there was nothing that said we couldn't. So it was just it was an awareness. It was an you know us finding out that hey, there's there's certain activities, certain situations we can put ourselves in that we hadn't thought about. Other folks have been doing this forever. So can you it was give me an example of what one of those activities or situations you had to going to other going to other campuses. Just just going to other campuses. I mean because. Uh, although we were uh, a local society within Purdue, you still could take field trips. You could still go and visit other campuses because other campus, other other universities, or other colleges were having activities going on, and we could go and you know we could go and network with those folks and talk to them. So those are the kind of things you know. Um, what I found is that our level of understanding, you know, became less limited because initially you think that, okay, well, you know, our focus is just here at Purdue. 
And I think that's part of the reason why we decided that, hey, this can be a national and even an international organization because there's nothing to keep us from driving to Indiana. You know, we were initially looking at some of the schools in Indiana. So Indiana University, Ball State, places that weren't too far away that we could get to. And it's like, well, we can go here. And initially it was well, we can go here for a party because, again, it was social. But realizing that there's other there's other universities or other schools of higher learning that have engineering programs, so we can go and talk to these folks and see how they're doing certain things. Mm-hmm. So that was that was some of the, you know, some of the motivation that caused us to, you know, like I say, look, you know, uh, broaden for lack of a better word, broaden our focus and look outside of Purdue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what would you say was the goal of the Society of Black Engineers when you were a student and leader to the local Purdue chapter? Well, I'd say the initial goals or the primary goals was always, you know, making sure that we had... uh, that we graduated everyone. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's like, well, we we have the Ed Barnetts and the, the Fred Coopers going off and excelling and being successful, and particularly when they come back and they're, you know, now they're employed professional engineers. And it's like, well, hey, we want to emulate those guys. So we wanted to make sure that we had maximum graduation rate, you know, and at the same time, and but... You know, yeah, as a junior and a senior, that's your focus. But you also look at um, the freshmen and the sophomores. And so you want to retain those. So you're looking at the attrition rate as well. And so you're saying we want to make sure that those behind us, you know, come along as well, as opposed to you're looking back and there were 50 people in line. Now there's only 25 people because, again, when we were some of the early the early conversations that we had when we were freshmen, we're sitting in the lecture hall, and again, there's only a handful of people in the lecture hall, and you've probably heard this, or you've probably even been exposed to this yourself, but you'd have a professor saying, you know, look look next to you, look around, and mm-hmm. some of these faces you see, you won't see in four years, you know, and so you're kind of like, wow. Initially, you're like, well, what, is, what does that mean? And then, then it dawns on you. It's like, you know, some of these people won't be able to make it through this. And so, again, a lot of our motivation was to make sure that, you know, we helped uh, those that were coming behind us to make sure that they got through the program, their particular programs that they were involved in as well, as opposed to just being, you know, having a, uh, self-interest or personal focus and just say, well, you know, I'm going to get a job. You know, mm-hmm. so I'm just worrying, I'm just worrying about getting a job. It's like, no, we've got to make sure that we build this organization, that we maintain, you know, the involvement that uh, we currently have. And then you look at, again, I, I, I know how important it was to, how motivating it was, at least for me, to see the Ed Barnett's and the Fred Coopers come back and talk to us because, you know, the inclination was I want to be like them. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to I want to be a professional like them. I you know I want to yeah I want to get a job. I mean, um, I'd say probably being short sighted. You know that that was the initial motivation was oh I just want to be employed. But more than that, it was like hey I want to be a professional engineer. And then as student leaders, and we're looking at the makeup of the organization, and we're saying, well, you know, we're juniors and seniors, and we have sophomores and freshmen, and we want to make sure that those sophomores and freshmen become juniors and seniors, and that they, too, can graduate and become professional engineers. So those were, those were some of the, the factors that we focused on. Mm-hmm. And then, so you mentioned that sort of the idea for a national society was sort of brewing (laughs) 
organically as you're working through this, working as a leader in the chapter. Could you tell me a little bit more about that and how you ended up with a first national conference? Well, again, I think for us, the advantage of being, again, you, you know, you hear the reference to the Chicago Six, and, you know, I don't know who came up with that label, but the fact that, you know, you're talking about a group of guys that were very close friends that lived together because we were at one point in time all roommates because, as I say, we started, well, we started out in the dormitories. Tony Harris and I were roommates initially in our freshman year. And then in our sophomore year, uh, we moved to a different dormitory. And um, Ed and I were room, Ed Coleman and I were room, roommates. And then when we moved off campus, George, Tony, John Logan, and um, let's see, George, Tony, John Logan. Yeah, we 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 actually moved off campus into a house. So at one point in time, we were all roommates together. Um, I know George and Stanley, they were roommates at one time. So we all had been exposed to being roommates together. And the fact that, you know, you, you're in contact with somebody, you know, all day, every day. You know, you're either in class with them, you're back at the dorm room with them. In this constant conversation. And so when you're going to these meetings or, okay, anytime you leave a meeting, you know, you're charged, you know, so you go into these meetings and uh, you're having these conversations uh, within the group about the organization and the potential or, of the organization. And you, you just find yourself constantly brainstorming. It's like, well, what what things can we do better? What can we do differently? How can we take this to another level? And so um, the the notion of going nationally evolved, um, and I would have to say collectively as opposed to individually, collectively, you know, we all were like, we all had different interests in terms of making this thing a national organization. And it just, it all came together um, at a point in time when it's like, okay, it's, it's time to do a national convention. And so we all took on individual responsibilities to make that, that first national conference a reality. And I would have to say, looking back on it, that it turned out really well. I mean... Again, you second guess yourself and there's things you say, well, knowing what I know today, we would have done this differently. But considering the resources that we had, the time, uh, our, our exposure and our knowledge at the time, I think that uh, it, went, it went well. Could you describe what the first conference was like? The first conference, again, we wanted to, one, we wanted to have a level of professionalism even though we were students, we wanted to have a level of professionalism that some organizations may not display. So we wanted to make sure that what what impresses me today when I go to nationals or I go to regionals and I see how the students uh, present themselves, you know, in business attire. I mean, even though um, as a society we've become more casual, you know, again, I, I I reflect back on when I was a kid, and even even if you had, you know, your your resources were limited, um, we didn't realize that we, you know, our parents were not uh, wealthy, but we felt like we had everything we needed. Mm -hmm. But you know, you had limited resources, financial resources, so as a result. You might only have, you know, when you talk about your Sunday best, you might only have one outfit that you wear routinely. But when you went to church or when you went to some function, 
you know, um, you usually dressed up, so to speak, as opposed to, well, you're, you're casual, you got on jeans. That just, that's not how people, that's not how they presented themselves. So, again, when you talk in terms of how we wanted the First National to be, we wanted the students to uh, present themselves in a professional manner. So, you know, we encouraged, you know, we didn't make it a mandate, but we encouraged everyone to wear business attire. Mm -hmm. So that meant whatever you had as far as business attire. Now you may not have a, a jacket, you may not have a, as a as a, a a male student, you may not have a suit, but you certainly a shirt and tie. You know, uh as a female student, you know, uh if not a dress, a blouse and a skirt, as opposed to like I say, just casual attire. And so that was, you know, that was that was one of the things that in our initial outreach, it's like, okay, this is how we want to present ourselves. And then the agenda was key because the way we set the agenda up, I mean, certainly not as as organized and as sophisticated as it is today at a national, because again, we weren't looking at those kind of the kind of resources that exist today. Uh, and even the technology that exists today. And we weren't, you know, going to hotels and having, you know, the conference in major banquet rooms. But just the fact that, okay, we're going to pick an environment on campus where people can feel like this is conducive to having a conference where you're bringing people in from all over the country. And, again, they're posturing in a business-like way or professional way. And um, everyone, when you talk about the Chicago Six, everyone had different responsibilities that facilitated making this thing go as smoothly as possible. So that, you know, that was really our, our main objective was to, okay, let's 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 try to look like we know what's going on and we're organized as opposed to something that's ragtag and haphazard. And like I said, with the, the limited resources that we had, uh, but with the help, I mean, I don't I don't even remember now if we if we had to pay a fee for the for the area that we held it in, but you have expenses as far as you know, refreshments, food, and stuff like that. So, again, the level of, you know, refreshments that we had was based on the financial resources that we had at the time. So, you know, it may have just been sandwiches versus a dinner. Mm -hmm. But, again, we said, hey, you know, this is how we want to present ourselves. Uh, and, again, some of that was based on, functions and other organizations that we had been exposed to and we were patterning ourselves afterward so as a result um that was that was our vision mm -hmm. in terms of that first conference what was your specific responsibility area that uh, had a little section? <laughs> kind of events planning okay. you know so it was like okay the different events that we have going on uh like right now you would have um during the day, as you know, the way the days are structured, you have um, those events where you bring together uh, the regional officers, and then you have the general body that comes together, and then you have the social activities later on after you take care of, you know, the, the business item so to speak and so my 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 main responsibilities was kind of as a court as a, an events planner in terms of making sure that all the different things that we decided we wanted to do that they came off without a hitch and mm -hmm. so I was reaching out and interacting with different people to okay well you're responsible with this and this is when you know basically this is when you're going to actually you know do what you're supposed to do so I was involved in just kind of stirring the pot and make sure everybody, you know, was on point and did what they needed to do. Okay. And then do you have a sense, like, from the engineering students who are coming to this conference, what that experience was like for them? So they're coming to Purdue in Indiana. 
Well, in, well, in terms of um, feedback prior to, not a lot, but the post feedback was really was where we really got an idea or really got an understanding of what we did well and what we didn't do well. You know, so we, and again, we, there were people, there were people that came to the conference that we knew prior to the conference. So it wasn't a situation where everybody that came were strangers. I mean, we had, we had friends from high school or people that we had met while at Purdue that, um, we had become acquaintances with. And so it was a situation of, again, the way you communicated. And again, you didn't, you didn't email uh, at that time. So it was a situation where we were getting feedback either by a phone call or a letter that, hey, you know, this is what I like. This is what I didn't like. This is what you did well. This is what you didn't do well. And so uh, I think as far as the objectivity, it, it helped us in terms of getting ready for the second one, mm-hmm. you know, and just understanding, okay, we thought we did this, or we thought, you know, we thought we hit a home run, but in fact, you know, we, we kind of fell short in this area, and it was it was all constructive, so mm-hmm. it was, I think that's, that's what was probably most positive about the first conference, was that everyone came there, you know, you know, they didn't have any hidden agendas, but everybody came like, okay, let's really see how collectively we can make this thing, you know, be successful. I mean, within any organization, you're always going to have people that have ulterior motives and have their own agenda in mind, but you had people coming from all over the country coming to Purdue, and I don't remember, I don't remember an instance where there was an attitude like, well, they think they're this and they, you know, they're going to get credit for that. No, I mean, no one was, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing of taking credit, but a thing of, you know, let's unify, let's collectively make this organization strong. And so when you guys leave here, you go back to your, your school and share with, you know your group because there were other there were other campuses that had you know societies on their campus so it wasn't like we were the only school that had a society of black engineers but it was just the fact that you know we position ourselves to spearhead this and so in that in that sense we get a lot of credit but there was all it wasn't like this was a rare unique phenomenon mm-hmm. but Again, it was a case of everybody being inclusive and going back and saying, hey, when we go back to wherever we're attending school, we're going to share with them what we experienced and, you know, just make this bigger and better. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of, like, from that feedback that you got, what was sort of a resounding, this was fantastic this was the big positive experience and then maybe what was you know some room for improvement well you you know I think I I think uh human nature you kind of you tend to you know discount the negative stuff (laughs) no seriously you know you you don't focus on that as much as because I mean again that that doesn't motivate you or charge you as much and so to sit here and say well I remember somebody saying that the food we didn't get we didn't have enough food or no i mean seriously but in terms of the positives the positives the one positive that i remember was just how well organized it was okay. is that okay it you know we we wanted to come off as being professional and and appear to know what we were doing and you know we got so many we got so much feedback in terms of how well orchestrated or how well organized the first conference was, you know, and in some cases we're kind of like, oh, wow, we didn't realize that we did that that well. But, and, you know, and I think, again, human nature, you kind of tend to, you know, uh, underestimate some of the things that you do when you do them well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a situation where people were like, wow, you guys – 
what you did was really you did you did it well. It was you did a good job. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so for those who may not be aware, the current mission of NSBE is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. So as the national organization evolved and now has that mission articulated, um, what are your thoughts on how it compares to your goals back in when you were a chapter member and then forming with that first national conference to now? Well, I think certainly, I again, when I go, whenever I go to a national or regional or, or any, any NSBE function, and I see how um, the students conduct themselves, I see how the, the function is put together. And, you know, and again, I think back to those early days when we were doing it, um, I look at, you know, I look at the fact that um, the goals, those those goals that are expressed in the mission statement, uh, are constantly being achieved, and um, you know, in in most cases, you know. Um, where I find that the students they they excel beyond expectations because uh, again it's a it's a student run organization uh, but again you see how professional the students conduct themselves and and I look at I look at the maturity level of some of these students you know and it, it amazes me because. Again, you know, when we were 20, 21 years old and we thought, you know, we thought we really had it together. And, you know, I look at the students now and some of the things that they're doing. And, and again, like I say, I look at, I look at uh, the activities that are put together and, and, and realizing that, you know, you have budgets now that you didn't have then. You have technology now that you didn't have then. But just um, taking advantage of all the resources, um, working as you know as a unified front, you know, which is what I see, and which is what our goal was. Because again, we were we kind of you know checked our egos at the door as opposed to. Well, I want to have credit. I want to take credit for this, and I, you know, and I did that. It's like no, it's it's not I, it's we, mm-hmm. you know. And so when I look at how when I look at how the organization has flourished, you know, since we first got involved, um, I mean, some of the things that come to mind is you know pride. Certainly, you know, you can look at it from the standpoint and say, well, I had a hand in starting this, and again. I feel like oftentimes we we get more credit than we we should only because you know there were so many there were so many people that were involved in starting this organization and I'm I'm not a credit person and that's just my personality so I'm not I'm not that individual that is going to run around and say you know boast about what I did you know it's just not it's just not my makeup and so, and I'm real, I'm, you know, I understand that in order to achieve or, or to be at the point that we're at now, it took efforts of a lot of people. And a lot of people don't get the recognition that they should have gotten. And we continue to talk about our bond. You know, Dr. Bond, we want people to understand and realize his legacy because, you know, he was so instrumental in... The organization being where it is today, and uh, individually, myself and I'm sure George, Tony, Ed would all agree. You know the influence and impact that he had on our lives as professionals, as well as just you know being mature adults. That he doesn't get the credit he deserves, mm-hmm. but. 
when you talk in terms of, uh, again, where the organization is in 2018 versus 1975, um, I don't think that I could have imagined it would be what it is today. But again, just just to watch these young people and how how they go about their business, how they deal with stuff. It, it you know I'm not surprised. Let's just say that um, I'm not surprised. Uh, it's amazed is not the word I want to use, but let's just say that you know when I see you know I I couldn't have imagined the organization being at this point, you know, at, at, in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But at the same time, um, really, you know, genuinely proud and really happy for the organization because as I say, you know, you have leadership changes in terms of, you know, the executive director, uh, again, you're constantly changing your your officers and your regional officers, you know, your national and your regional officers. But even though, you know, you make these changes, the people the people that come come behind have been groomed, uh, and they understand the mission, and they try to. Um, go about the the mission in in a way that, like I say, just promotes um, an organization that is inclusive and is trying to make sure that everybody does well. I mean, there's an I think there's an understanding, and I think that we had the understanding. One of the things that we understood when we were first involved with the organization, I think we, we all understood, we might not have expressed it as much, but I think we all understood if one does well, we all do well. You know, so, um, you know, the, the fact that, as I say, you know, everyone's, you know, everyone's goal has been and should be to make sure that everyone involved in the organization uh, prospers, does well, that the organization as a whole does well. Because if the organization as a whole does well and you're involved in the organization, then you're going to do well. Mm -hmm. Goes without saying. Yeah. And so keeping in mind the idea of, I mean, there's always going to be a community of support <laughs> mm -hmm. that's driving NSBE. Um, one of the unique uh, features of NSBE when you compare it to other organizations is that it's student-led, not only at the chapter level, but regional and national level. Mm -hmm. how, do you th how, how do you see that role as NSBE continues to grow in terms of the student-led aspect? Well, I think, I think that I, I, I'm, I'm of that mindset that, uh, you know, if it's, you know, if it's not, if it's not broken, don't change it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, it's working, it's worked well up to this point and there's, you're constantly tweaking it. So that, I mean, again, just with changing times, that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I think that it should always be a student run organization. Um, and and I and I I say that because, um, you know, if you if you were to take professionals, if you were take if you were actually take professionals and insert them in the roles that the students um, currently occupy, I think that the expectations would be different because of the exposure that the professionals have that the students don't have. There's, there's a certain, um, let, let's say for lack of a better word, you know, being naive in some respects is good because, you know, you haven't, it, it's a situation where it's, 
you know, you, you haven't been tainted, so to speak, and that might not be the best word, but it's just, you know, there's, there's a freshness that students bring to the table that professionals, I think, because of their exposure, because of their biases, wouldn't, they wouldn't have the same objectivity. And they may not have the same drive because they're motivated by different things. Because when you become a professional, you're motivated more by excelling within your career path, uh, salary, you know, whereas you don't have that same motivation as a student. As a student, yeah, you know, you're, you're motivated to, to graduate if you're going to do postgraduate work. Okay, that's a motivation, but you know, you're. I, I think there's a freshness that a student has that a, a professional would not bring to the table that makes the organization what it is and keeps it unique. And so I wouldn't change it. And well, anyone can join NSBE, both the name and mission, you know, really references black engineers. How important do you think the term black engineers is with the organization? Well, I think that when you say black, um, because of societal norms, I think some people look at that as uh, exclusive in terms of inclusive. But I think that the organization, well, I know the organization does a great job in letting, you know, letting people know that it's all inclusive. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that it's black, I think it lends to the fact that that's where the roots come from. But to say that you can only be in the organization if you're black, I think that uh, people know that's not the case. So I don't see black as a label or a deterrent, but only a, a sense of pride that, hey, this, this organization started, you know, with black students. Mm -hmm. And uh, what makes it even better is that the fact that it's all inclusive, you know, it, you know, it's open to any ethnicity, you know, it embraces any ethnicity and because of the way the students present themselves, I haven't, the different, the different ethnic groups that I've come in contact with within the organization um, at, again, at nationals, at regionals, there's always a comfort level that they have where they feel like it's family, and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, he, I mean, uh, a European student seems to be just as comfortable, you know, as an Asian student, as a, a, a Hispanic student, uh, as a black student, I, you know, I just see everybody as like, hey, you know what? Uh, we all look out for each other. We all take, and we we all deal with the mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And um, so, in the Purdue archives, they have some pictures of a Nesby torch statue dedication mm -hmm. ceremony, mm -hmm. uh, where there's a a statue of the Nesby symbol um, placed at Purdue or Key, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. So could you tell me a little bit about what you remember from that event and sort of the significance of that event to you? Well, um, that, that was humbling in the sense that you're talking about um, having, a, having something that's dedicated that will be there forever. So when you consider your name being somewhere where people are going to walk past and see it long after you're gone, that's, that's pretty humbling, you know. And it's something, whenever I see it, and I haven't seen it that often because I don't get back to campus, you know, like every year. But whenever I see it, it's like, wow, you know, this, this is here forever. You know, I mean, it, it's one of those situations where, um, it's a real testament 
it's a testament to the organization because I look at the organization first. It's a testament to the organization. And so when when the decision was made to do that, um, you know, I felt like not just the personal recognition, but the recognition for the organization was something that we could really feel good about because, um, you know, again, this isn't this doesn't happen every day uh, at, you know, at a place of higher learning like like Purdue. I mean, this is this, this is not commonplace. So this was this was definitely special. And when I when I look at it, you know, Stan Kirtley, you know, uh, John Logan, his son was there. So his son was representing him because uh, that was 94 and John passed in, in 87. But Stan Kirtley was still alive and just a lot of the pomp and circumstances that that they did for us. Uh, and again, I'm, you know, I'm uncomfortable with a lot of that because that's, I just, you know, <laughs> that's not me, but you know, they had, we were in, we were in a motorcade <laughs> and we were waving and people were lining the street. It was, it was, you know, it was something that I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. But like I said, just the fact that, um, we have something we have something, as you mentioned, now with the with the uh, renovations and whatnot, uh, the location has been relocation, re relocated to an even more prominent spot. It's something that you can really feel proud that students, uh, all ethnicities, walk past that and see it and look at the names. And of, although some of them, some of them might have don't have have a clue as to who Brian Harris is or who some of the other Chicago six are. Uh, it's just the fact that, you know, that's the kind of recognition that uh, you can f really feel proud of as an individual in an organization. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess at different points along the way, Purdue obviously provided a lot of support um, either in a person, faculty member or other students or a dedication ceremony to Nesby and um, the success of black engineering students at different times. How would you say that Purdue can continue to support uh, black engineering students and the organization as we move forward? Well, I mean, the whole notion of more and not less. So, I mean, at this point, um, we should not, as an organization, uh, NESME shouldn't be satisfied with what they're doing, but, you know, with what they're currently doing, but demand that they do more, you know, because we know that they can, you know, so we don't want to, we don't want to be complacent and feel like, oh, well, you know, the things that are going on, I mean, we've got, you know, you, you've got the building, you know, you've got the physical structures and facilities that the students can take advantage of, but, just knowing what we came from uh, and how long, you know, when I say we, when, when I first came to the campus in 71, uh, the, the resources that we had and the facilities that we have. And so now looking at what we have today, you know, it's, it's easy for people to say, oh, wow, man, this is great. This, you know, it's like, we should have had this a long time ago, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, one thing you know, one of the things that 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 uh, that I tend to do is is push the envelope. So I'm my attitude is, well, you know, we can ask for more because all they can do is say no. Mm -hmm. You know, but if we don't ask for more, we're not going to get it because they're not going to say, oh, hey, you guys want this, you want that. So I think we have to constantly, you know, we have to constantly challenge the university to make sure that. The organization and the the minority student population, you know, has what they need to excel, like the other organizations and the the other student body on campus. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's as simple as that. Yeah. And so, looking back over your personal and or professional life, would you say Nesby has had a significant role in who you are today? Oh, absolutely. Because again, like I say, just. 
it was so instrumental in socializing me. Um, the exposure that I've had or the exposure that I received when, again, being that uh, unaware uh, freshman student on campus coming to a meeting, to transitioning to a student leader, to becoming uh, an employee professional, um, to now being a, a husband, father, grandfather, um, you know, brother, cousin, nephew. Um, Nesby definitely, um, you know, definitely had had you know, had an effect on me in terms of the maturing process and making me the individual that I am, for sure. And in what ways, then, would you say your experiences at Purdue in general, either in or, in, in or out of Nesby, um, continue to shape who you are today? Could you give me an example? I would say probably the discipline um, and the attitude that, you know, one of, one of the things that I found being an engineer, um, you know, you're a problem solver. Um, oftentimes you'll hear people say that as an engineer, you can branch off into just about any profession. You know, just based on the the foundation that engineering gives you, and and it's it's so true. You know, it's one of those things. I think that personally, there are times, there are challenges that I've had personally that had I not been an engineer, had I not had the exposure that I had at Purdue, uh, had it not matured me um, like it did. Uh, certain things within my life wouldn't have turned out as positive as they did. But, you know, being, being exposed to Purdue, being an engineer, at the time that I was there as a student engineer, um, I just developed that attitude that, you know, I can persevere through anything, you know, and I can, you know, it's like, that never, never say die, never give up, you know, somehow you're going to make it through this. You know, I mean, though, looking back and you look at some of the challenges that you had and, and, you know, that I had and I say, well, in some cases they may not have been life, life changing, but some of, some of them were. And so when I look back on them and I say, well, had things gone differently, you know, what would my life be like today or where would I be? And I would have to say that it's just a result of the exposure I had being in West Lafayette, being a student engineer in the 70s uh, with a group of friends that, that were like-minded, uh, being exposed to people like, again, Dr. Bond, Sonny Taylor, you know, who wanted to see us excel. Um, again, the, the atmosphere, the social atmosphere that existed and certainly that existed on our campus at the time, um, because again, that was during the, you know, when we were in school and when we were graduating, that was during the time of affirmative action. So, of the societal norms at that time were, um, let's just say, a lot more open than they seem to be at this point in time. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's like, you know, we, we seem to be regressing to a certain extent. And so, as a result, um, we had opportunities, there were opportunities that were made available to us that certainly people hadn't had before and uh, we took advantage of them and so what I would only say now is that you know those those opportunities they served me well and they help they help mold me into the person that I am what 
what advice would you give to a Purdue Nesby student now who's trying to be successful? Well, I would say, you know, go in, go in with as serious an attitude as possible. Don't go in, and, and I can say this, you know, being older, uh, having experienced it, but there's got to be a balance. So you need you need a balance that there. I would not say that become a recluse and, and all you do is study because that's not a balance. But go in with a serious attitude. Hopefully, uh, surround yourself with people that are like minded. That that was a major advantage for me. Okay, now everybody can't do that. Everybody can't go there with a group of friends and take that journey that we took. But if you can, you know, try to find people that are like-minded with similar interests, you know, that you can form a support group and, you know, from day one, take take a serious approach be be very serious about what you're doing because it's it's not fun and games you know it is i mean because again there's decisions that you're going to make or not make that are going to be life-changing so you have to approach it that way but if you do that um you know other things are going to fall into place you you know again my attitude is you know I can, you know, I can worry about what I can control and the other things and I have to, you know, I, I'm a person of faith. So it's like, OK, you know, I feel like these things are going to work out, but everything is not within my control. So I can only deal with what I can control. But again, if my attitude is positive, if I'm around positive people, then the outlook looks good. like to share about your experiences with Nesby or Purdue that we haven't discussed yet? Well, I don't think you have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> but I would only say that again, I, you know, I thank God for Nesby. You know, um, the afford me the opportunity to be exposed to people like yourself. Uh, to, again, like I say, to have the opportunity to experience uh, Purdue uh, experience at a time when, as I say, you know, um, you know, we were we were really when you talk about minorities, we were really in the minority because we were talking about hundreds of students on uh, with a student body of tens of thousands. So when you look at when you look at the the ratio, we were definitely in the minority. But at the same time, like I say, the we just had a, phenom a phenomenal support group, you know, whether it's faculty or friends, you know, the student body itself. And so uh, that's just something that, like I said, I'll always be grateful for. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank well, you thank for your you. Time. Thank you so much, Tasha.